per essere qui con noi oggi e vorrei eh, soprattutto ringraziare Bill Viola per essere venuto qui. È un benvenuto che gli do in modo eh, molto speciale, molto caloroso, perché ha fatto una lunga strada per venire qui, perché Bill Viola è senza dubbio uno degli artisti più importanti del nostro tempo e averlo qui con noi a Pisa è un privilegio per tutti noi. Non faccio nessuna presentazione perché eh, sarebbe assurdo che mi mettessi a, a raccontare eh, il eh, curriculum di Bill Viola o l'importanza del suo lavoro di cui lui stesso fra un momento ci parlerà. Vorrei sottolineare molto velocemente tre punti che mi sembrano significativi a me, dal mio punto di vista di uno che non studierà mai la videoarte ma che studia cose più antiche. Il primo è il rapporto dell'opera di Bill con la tradizione, con la, con la grande tradizione artistica. Per esempio l'uso che lui ha fatto, l'uso estremamente eh, intelligente e acuto che lui ha fatto della, del, della forma del trittico, nel, nel suo trittico di Nantes e non solo in quello. È un uso molto eh, particolare perché non è citazionismo. Lui non cita la forma del trittico, lui usa la forma del trittico, cioè lui ha saputo usare il trittico come forma d'arte, l'interazione fra le varie parti del trittico in un modo in cui, eh, in cui ha rinnovato profondamente questa tradizione, avendola interamente assimilata. E in questo senso eh, la, eh, la congiunzione fra una profonda conoscenza della tradizione è un, è un uso molto intenso e molto personale di tecnologie più avanzate del nostro tempo, mi sembrano particolarmente significative. Secondo punto, l'opera di Viola mi sembra molto importante anche come riflessione sulla storia dell'arte. Come riflessione sulla storia dell'arte, riflessione che lui fa da artista e non da storico. Sono rimasto molto colpito quando ho visto questa sua opera che si chiama Greeting, The Greeting, che è ora esposta a Carmignano e che è partita e è stata ispirata molto consapevolmente, molto chiaramente, da, eh, dal quadro di Pontormo, dalla visitazione di Pontormo che è a Carmignano. Eh, secondo eh, uno storico dell'arte e della cultura a me molto caro, che si chiama Warburg, l'essenza stessa del rinascimento, dell'arte rinascimentale, consiste consisteva nel mostrare il movimento dei panni al vento. Ora, quello che Bill Viola, senza avere probabilmente mai letto Vago, glielo ho chiesto, non, ho, non lo ha letto, quello che lui ha fatto in quest'opera ha estratto esattamente questo dettaglio, considerandolo il punto chiave della sua composizione. Dunque anche qui c'è un, un rapporto con la tradizione, ma un rapporto molto profondo. L'ultimo punto che vorrei dire e che eh, Bill Viola è, è uno di quegli artisti molto rari che non si esprime soltanto attraverso eh, il lavoro che fa, le immagini che produce, ma che sa parlare. Io eh, ho avuto eh, il piacere, il privilegio di averlo per eh, un anno accademico al Getty a Los Angeles quando lavoravo lì e lui partecipava a questi seminari in un anno in cui il tema era Representing the Passions eh, lui eh, partecipava a questi seminari settimanali delle volte non diceva niente delle volte parlava e quando parlava le cose che diceva eh, non erano mai, e lui ci teneva sempre a dirlo da scholar, ma erano da artista ed erano però straordinariamente intense precise, mi hanno molto insegnato infine vorrei eh, per dare solo un brevissimo esempio della sua del, 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 delle cose che lui dice, vorrei da un suo libro pubblicato da poco in italiano leggere una sola frase, quando lui dice che registrazioni rozze e dirette nel nostro contesto abituale possono avere una grande forza, perché giacciono come equazioni irrisolte nella società contemporanea. Si tratta di misteri nel vero senso della parola, che non sono intesi per essere risolti ma piuttosto sperimentati e vissuti. Questa è la natura del loro potenziale conoscitivo. Queste immagini potenti sono come richiami al risveglio ed io credo che oggi si senta il bisogno di risvegliare il corpo prima di essere in grado di risvegliare la mente. Eh, Bill ci ha fatto, oltre al dono della sua presenza qui, un altro dono, ci ha donato, ha donato alla scuola alcune delle sue opere, e io lo vorrei ringraziare anche di questo, 
vorrei infine dire che eh, eh, Bill Viola ci parlerà in inglese, come tutti sapete, non ho eh, voluto eh, predisporre una, una traduzione simultanea per, perché eh, credo che arrestare il flusso delle cose che lui ha da dirci e da mostrarci, soprattutto ci mostrerà alcuni dei suoi lavori più eh, recenti, sarebbe stato un errore. Preferiamo sentirlo tutti in, eh, nella, nella, nella lingua in cui eh, si sente più a suo agio, anche se sa abbastanza l'italiano. Poi lui eh, farà dei gesti come un italiano e quindi quello, quello funzionerà molto bene e il, quando si passerà alle oh, domande le domande eh, tutti si devono sentire liberi di farle anche in italiano ci sarà qualcuno che ci aiuterà a tradurre grazie hello and uh, thank you uh, professor Settis and I just want to thank you for Uh, making this possible it's an honor for me to be here with all of you and I've had an extraordinary time in the last three days visiting the great fresco works uh, from the uh, Renaissance in Florence and Orvieto and uh, Arezzo and of course Assisi and um, I am absolutely exhausted and emotionally drained, which I will talk about, uh, and inspired, because there's nothing that has happened in the history of the world like what happened in Italy 500 years ago. Completely extraordinary. I spent some time in Florence in the 1970s. I lived there from 19 74 till 1976 by the invitation of an extraordinary woman who is here today. Her name is Maria Gloria Bicocchi. She's right there. <laughs> She's one of the most generous and vivacious and special people that I know. She, out of her heart, I think mostly, one of the biggest hearts I've ever met, decided she would open a studio for video artists international studio in Florence on Via Ricasoli positioned between the Duomo and Michelangelo's David. <laughs> and uh, it, not only was the location very symbolic, but um, Michelangelo representing the new way and the Duomo the old way. But um, Also, the idea of having a video studio in the early 1970s was really exceptional. You have to understand, in the days before the internet, there were also the days before the video camcorder. There were even days before video. Video appeared in 1968. So this is an art form that has happened in our lifetime now. It's happened in our lifetime. It began 40 years ago. So, when Luca, Luca Signorelli was painting the frescoes in Orvieto that Fra Angelico had started, it was about the same time, same time difference. So we are now in the I don't want to say post-video age, but we're in a new age right now, a new time. And video has a very special place in that time. At the same time, though, a new instrument, the computer, is now affecting video as well as the rest of the culture. So we are truly in an age that is in the middle of a revolution in technology, a revolution in image making, a revolution in thinking, a revolution in communication, and anything else you can think of that affects your life. In banking, in news, in buying things in shops, the whole world is being affected by this, this medium. And so I think there's a lot of parallels between today and the 15th century. There's a lot of parallels. Think of the 15th century. Beginning of the 15th century, you had artists discovering and 
realizing a brand new way of making images which had three dimensions to it. This was radical beyond belief, absolutely radical, that an image on a wall could give the appearance of depth, of space. That was not, no one had ever thought about that before. And it created a new way of image making so different from the past, from the Gothic Byzantine image making systems of the past, that there was a, a, an incredible break just in the way, I think, that the computer and electronic medium have given us a new way of making images in our time right now. But if you can imagine, say, 40 years ago, the way nothing like they're made today. And to my mind, the, the time when there was such a radical shift, I think, really was when cinema was developed. Because that's the first time, really, artificial images had movement. That was a great, great shift into the fourth dimension instead of the third. And the other thing that happened, too, uh, obviously, in the 15th century, you had Gutenberg printing press. The printing press came out in the middle of the century. Within, I was reading somewhere, something like within 10 years, 10 or 20 years, there was something like 50,000 books in print. People who had never been able to have a book before, because they were all handwritten, special, very expensive, privileged documents, now were able to get books circulating, just like exactly the same way that the internet today is allowing us to go online and gather information from almost anywhere in the world. Now everyone can do that at home without being a special scholar to go to some special library. And then, of course, at the end of the century, in the 15th century, they put a man on the moon. Some guy got in a boat, and he went way across the ocean, and he discovered a new world. That's what they called it, the new world. So we didn't get it quite right. Neil Armstrong came before uh, the internet, but it's, it's, all, it's all sort of connected. So let me, um, let me just talk a little bit about what it meant to live in Florence and to be in Florence. Um, my life really changed at that time besides the fact that I was young and things were open. But I had, n had not been prepared in my studies in school to encounter art the way that I did in Florence. First of all, at the time I was in art school, anything that was old was bad. So if, in other words, if your mother liked it, don't do it. <laughs> was not, had to be completely avant-garde. So if my mother understood it, couldn't do it. So. When I arrived in Florence, I had already rejected art history as being um, the old stuff, boring, only studied by scholars. I was interested in abstract art. I was interested in, you know, Rothko and Pollock and Rauschenberg and all those guys. So this stuff was not that interesting for me. And. Um, but what I did realize when I came here was something really shocking, that these pictures that I had seen in my art history classes, which were taken perfectly directly on, straight, perfect, framed in the book like this, full, full page. All of a sudden, you go to Santa Croce to see the Giotto, and it's 10 meters up in the air in a tiny room, and you're looking at it like this, and you can't really quite see it. And there's some vague light coming in on the side, and it puts a shadow across the wall. And furthermore, you look around and you realize there's no white walls. And there's no nice polished wooden floor. And in fact, this is not a museum. You know, Peter Sellers, the opera director, who's a friend of mine, when we were working on this exhibition of mine, said, you know, when you go into a museum and you see the polished wood floors, clean, perfect, and you see the white walls, the only conclusion you can have is that this must be a hospital and the works must be sick. <laughs> and that was not the case, what I saw when I, was, uh, when I spent that time in Florence. I saw kids being misbehaving. I saw some old lady praying, lighting candles somewhere. I saw a bunch of German tourists coming in, talking very loudly. 
And then when I got out of, the, out of the church, I walked down the street, there was some old lady down the end of our street who every morning would come and put fresh flowers for the little Madonna up in the little niche in the wall. You know, and she was not you know, an art uh, connoisseur. Uh, she was doing something else. So for the first time, I encountered these works as kind of a part of life in truly a public space. If you look in history, of course, you realize that a lot of them were not in public spaces. They were very often kept in special family chapels and, and access was restricted, but some of them were available to people and they were placed out there. Um, looking at the frescoes in the last few days, I realized how close they are to television and the movies. Because TV and the movies are stories that we already know in a way. You know, you go to an art museum and what you actually expect is a wall label explaining what you're seeing. Go to the cinema, there's no wall label. There's no curator that wrote, you know, here's this, his work is doing blah, 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 because you know the language already. You know, cinema today is really one of the only truly conventional art forms that we have. Because once contemporary artists broke with the academy and decided they would go out on their own in opposition to the established culture in the 19th century in France, at the same time, they broke with the kind of accepted conventions and of literacy, of reading images, of understanding images, which had been in place for hundreds and hundreds of years. So as a young artist, at the time I was in Art Tapes 22 in Florence working, I made some of my first videotapes as artist in residence in Channel 13 in New York at a place called the Television Laboratory, which had been set up precisely to bring artists into television studio to make work. And you have to understand also in the 1970s, in the days before video camcorders that everybody could buy in the store, the video technology was really expensive and the best technology was in the hands of the institutions, kind of in the way the church controlled all the money and all the power and had the best places to put the art. Well, the TV stations were like that too. And so there were some places that um, were able to get some money from the state to bring artists in to work, and that's the first place that I worked on. So when I was 26 years old, the first series of videotapes I made practically were shown on television, which was completely uh, extraordinary. It was extraordinary. Because at that time, not only could I not get into the Museum of Modern Art, because I was too young and I was unknown, and they were, they were of course showing all the big artists, but getting onto television or anything was even, you know, you didn't even think it was even possible. And then all of a sudden, here's this opportunity. And people like Namjoon Pike and Peter Campus and uh, actually Bruce Nauman as well made videos which were broadcast on television, which I think is really, uh, was really an incredible uh, step that happened. Now, the other thing that I noticed um, when I was in, uh, that I think connected me eventually with these paintings that I had rejected when I was in Florence was the connection to technology. Because this was a time when artists were completely involved with technology. Perspective painting was something you had to study for years in school. It was so counterintuitive as to how one made images that similar to computer graphics today, you had to spend some serious time knowing the structure and knowing the system. So here was a system of painting based on a mathematical structure based on mathematics, the, the system of perspective came from cartography, from mapping the world, the grid system. And here was a system based on, uh, uh, you know, dividing space in a mathematical, uh, according to a mathematical system, which seemed very um, abstract, seemed very abstract. And my, personally, my favorite time in art is watching the transition between, at the beginning of the 15th century, when artists didn't quite understand how to completely, uh, re optically, realistically uh, create images. Uh, and they, so they got some of the space and the perspective a little wrong. Um, now I just was uh, in 
um, well, the other point I guess I wanted to make about visiting the frescoes was that really impressed me deeply. I mentioned they, they seem to be connected to movies. And I saw them really as moving images, probably for the first time, seeing them in such a concentrated way. When you come into the upper basilica in, in, uh, in, in, uh, of San Francesco in, in Assisi, and you, you come in the door and you see these frescoes down both walls on either side in this enormous open space. You know, you have to realize at the time too when people came into these churches, this was one of the largest interior spaces they had ever seen, ever. They had never seen an interior space. In fact, to this day, these are some of the largest interior spaces that we have. The quality of sound in, in the cathedrals, uh, there would have been nothing like it. No one would have ever heard echoes like that. And Maria Gloria can remember that when I lived in Florence, I spent a lot of time with my tape recorder. And I went into these churches and I recorded space. I didn't record the mass and I didn't record the music. I would go in very quietly, discreetly, I'd stand in the corner, I'd turn on my microphones, and I would get that sound of the space. And I made um, acoustic portraits of all the major uh, churches in Florence. And then I began to realize, you know, when you see a, um, a kind of one of the cliches in movies is when you see a dream sequence in a movie, if you notice the sound that they use is this kind of echoey, reverberant sound. And I think that that sound came originally from the churches, from being in the churches. Because there's nothing really like it. If you go into a cave, when you go in a cave, the sound doesn't reverberate like that. Because sound reverberates from parallel walls. You need parallel walls to have an echo. And a cave is all sort of natural and broken up. So it doesn't even, it doesn't do the same thing with sound. So I, I think those spaces are the first time that people ever felt that kind of sense of space and an infinite reflection of sound that just kept going on. Of course, the singing in that church in that environment is, 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 is truly extraordinary. Now, let me tell you, I wanna, um, before I show you something, I'm gonna show you some uh, actually new work today. And what I wanna do first is I wanna just talk a little bit about my instrument, the video camera. And some of the things I've come to understand and learn about it that I think also connect to uh, much larger kinds of issues. And the experience I've had with a video camera, I first picked one up in 1970, so it's been about 31 years that I've been using this medium. And of course the medium has changed tremendously, but basically at the heart of even a digital camcorder today is a very similar system to what I was using uh, 31 years ago. And over a long period of time working, I didn't set out in any way to make an analysis of, of video and, and approach it since systematically. You have a set of ideas, you get, some, you get some thought inside you and you need to do something. And in fact, I think in many ways, what the artistic work really is, is trying to reconcile what's inside in some intangible thought, feeling space with all of this hard, stuff of the material world on the outside. How do you get a vague notion or a incom an incomplete thought or a feeling or sense that something is there? How do you get that into a form that has to go out and go into the world, like these glasses, piece of stone? How do you do that? Um, e. H. Gombrich called painting the contest with reality. How to get this completely in unexplainable uh, ethereal to a physical form. Video has given us a very interesting set of new ways to deal with that age-old problem and very, very profound, to my mind, uh, ways to deal with that problem. First of all, with video, one of the most unprecedented aspects of it is that the image that lives in the camera is simultaneous with our existence right now. That never had happened before in the history of art. Never had been 
had there been an artificial image created in a, out of a new material, I'm not just talking about light now, because you know the camera obscura is actually a very old, old uh, uh, technology originating, we think, in ancient China. The video camera takes light and it translates the light into a picture, into an image, which is made up of electrons, of electricity, electrical form. But that image is simultaneous right now. When you look in a video camera viewfinder, in a, in a lot of them, and originally in all of them, what you see inside is not a lens. Look, you don't see the view outside the lens. Very often you see an image of a little monitor. The image is already translated into an electronic form. And when I had the opportunity to shoot film for the first time in 1992, we were on the set and the cameraman asked me, he said, you know, you really should look through the lens because, you know, we have to see, you know, how we're framing this shot. And I was sitting next to the camera looking at the video image, which now, you know, when they shoot movies, they have a little, it's called a video assist. They have a small video camera in the viewfinder of the film camera that lets you see what the camera sees and then therefore you can record it and play it back to see the, the scene and if you got what you want. Um, so I, I said, okay, so I looked through the lens and I had the, I had the strangest empty feeling like I wasn't seeing anything. I looked through and I said, so, you know? So what I was looking at was an image, not a, I wasn't looking at an image, I was looking at the direct line of sight from the viewfinder right through the lens of the camera right out onto the set where the people were. And I had been so used to so many years to looking at an already translated image into, into some different form that for me this wasn't like looking at anything. And in reality it wasn't because what, I, what you actually will really see is when the film comes back from the laboratory the next day. That's when you really see the image in film. So I realized all of these incredible people who were so talented technically had been working in a system where they didn't even see the results of what they were doing at the moment that they were doing it. That really shocked me. So this idea that the image um, f uh, for the first time uh, really exists in a, in a simultaneous parallel form to us is, is really important. And the other aspect of it, I think, that makes it unique is that it's electronic. In the digital age now, of course, we have digital cameras. It's similar, but it's different. We'll talk about that a little later. But the image is electronic. And because it's electronic, what it means is that, that the image itself is a vibrating electrical signal. It's like a living thing, you know? In fact, I, I was staying in a, in a palazzone in uh, Cortona that the school has. And Professor Setas took me in a room where Luca Signorelli was painting, and he had, it was the last painting we think that he did, because he was doing a fresco uh, in a small chapel, and when he got up to the top, apparently, according to Vasari, he fell off the scaffolding and died. So I told him that, well, maybe, you know, maybe in uh, a couple of years' time, I'll electrocute myself, you know. Because the thing that's really scary about video is you can kill yourself. It's possible. And you remember in uh, Art Tapes 22, many stories with people plugging things into the wall, spark comes out. So it is real electricity in these circuits in this stuff. It has some kind of power. Now because it's electronic, what you can also do, it means because it's a vibrating system, you can, it's malleable. It's like a piece of clay. You can affect it, you can shape it, you can change it. You know, even on a television set today, you can go up and you can change the color, you can change the contrast, you can change the brightness. It's a, it's a completely flexible thing. It's not fixed. It's not carved in stone. Now, because it's electronic, it's capable of, the, of a third and, I think, extremely important thing, and that is it can be broadcast. Because the history of television, of video, is, in fact, first and foremost, the history of broadcast like radio. The second development in this history is the history, uh, is, the, is the, the beginning of, um, of the image uh, being recorded. So the recorder came after the image had been in existence. For the first 15, 20 years of television, they were recording it on film. They were shooting film right off the TV screen. That's how you see all of those old programs. They had no way to record it at the beginning. 
because it can be broadcast, that created the whole idea of the network, the first internet, the first network, broadcast television, came into everybody's home. You had the image coming right into your home in a box. Everybody saw it at the same time, giving us another really extraordinary concept, and that is the idea of simultaneity. I remember when I was young, um, they had a broadcast on the first international broadcast from New York to Paris, and they had one of the reporters standing in, in, in Paris live. It was the first time they connected New York and Paris live. And, of course, we did that from the moon, too. But that idea of, of, of absolute simultaneous time, I don't think, is, is another thing that really existed before in our consciousness. Y you know, you, you couldn't, before telephones, before radio, you couldn't imagine that you could, you could have simultaneous connection in two places on the earth because time and space were always the same thing. It took time to go over the mountain to the next city. It took time to get in a boat and go across the sea to the next place. The idea of being there at the same moment was com is completely inconceivable. And so you had this, you had immediately in the history of video this incredible network that was connecting really at, at, a, at a certain point it became global. And again, the fact that we were asked to be part of that in a small way with our works, I think, was, uh, was really amazing. And then the other thing, I think, um, that's really um, critical is that the, the images we were using were moving. And nothing in my training in art school prepared me for moving images. All of the lessons, all of the classes I took were based on the idea of the still image. So it holds still long enough even for us to study it. <laughs> you know? And now all of a sudden here's this medium where the images are moving. And if you approach that not from the point of view of cinema, because I didn't go to film school, I went to art school, then you're in a completely different domain. Images are moving. And again, looking at these artworks the last few days, I can't help but think how connected to movement these artists were. The piece that uh, Professor Sedis mentioned um, of mine, The Greeting, which is based on Pantormo's uh, visitation, the visitation being one of the most common images, themes that were used by artists uh, in that period. Um, it's an image of two women coming together. Mary and Elizabeth, they approach. And Mary is going to the countryside to visit her sister because she's pregnant and she has to tell someone. She's really worried. She got pregnant in a very strange way. Some angel well, right, came <laughs> and whispered to her. <laughs> Who's the father? <laughs> um, and so she got this whisper from Gabriel. And then she became panic stricken. She became really worried, like any woman would if all of a sudden she found out she was pregnant and she didn't plan on it. And maybe she wasn't even married. <laughs> but um, so she had to go to the countryside to visit, to uh, seek comfort in her sister, Elizabeth who was actually also pregnant with St. John the Baptist. So that's probably two of the heaviest, most intense pregnancies that we've seen in a long time. But, um, but that's a very special moment. Think about it, OK? You are afraid. You're filled with fear and panic. The only person who can make you feel better, who you have to share this incredible secret with, that you've also been told, by the way, this just is in a normal pregnancy. You know, um, you know, there are social services for things, but this one is the pregnancy that will change the world. So that's pretty serious. So the moment when these two women come together is so fi is filled with so many things. And and if you look at at the painters, that's very often what they show us in the visitation. What do they show us? They don't show us, usually, after they've met and they're hugging, right? You can imagine that scene. Imagine going on a journey and you need to reach someone and you're traveling, 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 and you're really nervous and you can't, it's taking forever, and you think you're going to die, and you finally get there, 
and there she is. There's the only person in the world can help you, and you, you have to go up the hill to see her, and she's at the door, and you have to reach, and you finally get there, and then you embrace, and you probably just start weeping, crying, you're relieved, but they don't show us that part, do they? They don't show two ladies like this, just you know, on each other. What do they show? They show this moment. The moment of maximum tension. Maximum tension. Coming like this, freeze that frame. Because if you're a painter, you only have one frame. Imagine all you young video artists out there. Imagine, you know, if, if, you, if you take a videotape of one half hour, 30 minutes, there's, there's over 54,000 frames in 30 minutes of video. 54,000 pictures, okay? Now someone comes along and says, you have one. Which one do you pick? That's the problem of the painters who are painting with optical images after Brunelleschi Alberti and perspective. That's the problem because it's a problem of time. We study these works of, with composition, color, form, yes, 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 but it's time. It's a problem of time. Which moment do you show? You know, which moment do you show when Gabriel comes in? You know, the moment of maximum tension. It's just turning. Just receives the word. You know, so where to position that frame in the timeline is really the art of that painting, those paintings, and they do it extraordinarily well. Now, the beautiful thing that we can do as video artists is we can show the time before the tension of the journey for Mary. On the train, she's really worried, biting her nails. She can't stop thinking her whole life is going to collapse. We can show the arrival and the coming closer together. We can show that moment of the Pantormo. Click, there it is. And then we can go through that moment, and they touch, and they embrace, and they break down, and they share things, and she's relieved. So. The opportunity you have as a video artist or a filmmaker, and people who work in theater, of course, have known this for millennia, because that's what the art of theater shows us. But now we have an artificial image system that can show us the before, the moment of, and the after. And when I work with video, I, I, I felt in these last few days also an incredible connection uh, awareness of these painters as sculptors. So they're not just working with time, they're also working with space. And they're creating three-dimensional works of art that we actually enter, physically enter, if you go into one of those chapels with the frescoes. But they're working with, with space. And for me, since I think spatially, discussing this idea of the time form, for me, I'd have to say probably more than anything when I make work, that's the thing I'm most aware of. In fact, um, very often I think, now that I've started working with performers in my more recent work, so you can speak to people and get them to do a certain action in a certain way and you can try another way, you have some control over the, the scene as opposed to going out on the street with your camera you know, and just shooting what's there like I used to do. Um, now now I, I can control what people are doing and how they're doing it. So we can shape the time form very directly. And for me, my um, grasp on reality, the thing that, that, that I hold on to is the time in the scene, not the image. That to me is the reality. That's where the sculpture is. That's where the form is. And on some pieces I feel it very, very strongly. And I would imagine um, that musicians would feel the same way. That musicians have to make time become a palpable physical thing almost, a shape like a landscape. They have to be able to do that, I think, in order to feel the whole. Um, and the other interesting thing about both music and video, moving images and film, is that they don't really exist at any given moment. You have to go through the entire Bach cantata to get to the end to know what it is. You have to sit in the movies for two hours to see the whole film in order for you to know what it is. 
it literally does not exist at the moment, unlike these eternal images on the walls of all the churches here in Tuscany. So we're really working with th something that doesn't exist. It only can exist after it's over. That's where Fellini's films are right now, in your minds if you've seen them. And that's the only place they can be complete. So let me show you a, um, a recent uh, piece of mine. Uh, and uh, I want you to think about the idea of the time form with it, because I think it's a very, very physical thing when you see this piece. Um, it's a diptych uh, piece with two screens. And uh, what I'm going to show you right now is not really the piece, because I'm going to show you the two images put together on one screen. So I have two of them vertically. There's an image of a man, another one there's an image of a woman. And the composition came from the early um, uh, uh, images of uh, Christ as the man of sorrows, suffering. And the early versions of the man of sorrows, you see Christ from the waist up, just been taken down from the cross or with a crown of thorns. And that kind of composition interested me very much, the idea of a torso person's torso, but at the same time, these screens being these wide screens, when you turn them, <laughs> show you this piece, uh, it's about eight minutes long, and it's called um, Breakdown, okay, so can we see the first one, please?
very aware of um, seeing the works that I've been um, experiencing the last couple of days is th the people in the pictures were real people. You really get the sense when you see these works that you're looking at actual people. That they used models. They painted the faces of people who they knew, who they asked to pose. Or in some cases, they, they painted the faces of important people, famous people of the time. In the uh, Luca Signorelli frescoes of The Last Judgment, you see in the corner a self-portrait of him and Fra Angelico standing side by side. Um, and when you look at the Piero de la Francesca frescoes, there are those beautiful moments where people are looking out of the frame. And in quite a few of the other works, too, people look right out of the picture right at you. You have this kind of eye contact with someone from another time. And that's a real curious thing, because before that time, when we weren't dealing with pictures made by uh, in the way that the eye sees, that the people were not represented directly, literally, as the eye sees them. Once you get into the world of optics, even though these artists didn't use cameras, what we call as of what we know of as a camera, in a way they were using the same kind of system. And once you get into the world of the world as the eye sees it, as I said earlier, you're in the world of the present moment, and you're in the world of facts, verifiable facts. That's why photography had such an important use and still does to this day as documentation, as evidence, as verification. That's why we are, we're in this strange kind of world today of movie stars. And we know that Russell Crowe is not Gladiator, Maximus. And we appreciate him for being Russell Crowe. So we look at this movie, and we have to do something that the critics and commentators on films have told us is called suspension of disbelief. And we have to look at these movies, and we have to know that these are real people, our contemporaries, and yet at the same time they're dressed up as Roman gladiators having a battle, and we have to believe that that's happening. That's kind of incredible, you know, that that actually happens. But the actual real power of the movie stars in Hollywood is in the fact that we know that these are real people and that they can be photographed in restaurants that we can see in the newspapers. So it's sort of double-edged reality. And um, I had a lot of strange ideas about actors and, and not much experience with them before I started making these, this more recent series of works. And uh, I really learned a lot. What you just saw, I don't, wouldn't classify exactly as acting. Um, although, I guess I've come to realize that acting is the best, the best actors are actually having experiences. They're not pretending to have an experience. They're actually going through those emotions that you see them going through. Now, they're doing it in, a, in such a way that they're, they're going with whatever method they use in, in their theatrical training, Stanislavski or whatever. They're going inside themselves for some actual experience that's bringing up recalling these emotions. But the emotions are real. The emotions are real. Um, and so it was very... Um, strange for me to be in a position where I was asking them to do something that was very, very difficult and uh, in some cases painful. And I felt very, um, I had a, a real responsibility not to take advantage of them. Um, and it was very disturbing, even for myself, um, working with some of these people. Uh, so I, I thought about that when I was looking at those, those frescoes and to, and to think that 
that once we started painting as the eye sees it, once images entered the world of the eye, then they automatically left the world of the sacred and absolutely came down to earth. And I think that's one of the real powers of art as it was um, evolved in Italy here in the 15th, 16th centuries, was that not only were these stories about a god that actually walked with us on earth and actually could get hurt and could suffer pain and could be wounded and could die like the rest of us and was born like the rest of us. That's pretty amazing to have a god come down. You know, those guys in ancient Greece didn't come down from Mount Olympus, you know, and do that. This was kind of a new, a really unprecedented thing. But then furthermore, they had a system of image making that was also based on the real world in a very, very direct way. And one of the um, really interesting things to see in those pictures is uh, the people wearing contemporary dress, you know, people wearing clothes of the time, uh, in enacting these sacred scenes that were at that time thousands of years old but actually existed in some kind of mythic space. So they were very, they not only were aware of that issue, but they used it directly in their work to contemporize the mythology, the story, and make it be all the more real. If these people are dressed like me, new, and here's the adoration of the Magi, and they're like, everybody's dressed like me and you, then, then that, that, that story, that myth is completely real and contemporary. And I think also that's why um, the images of suffering were so powerful in, in the history of Christian art. I spent uh, some time, as many of you know, living in Japan. And speaking with my Japanese friends, one of the things I heard very, very often was how uncomfortable they were when they came to Europe and they went to the museums and they saw these historical paintings. To have, paint, to have images so blatantly and directly of a human being suffering and undergoing pain and death right before your eyes made them feel really, really uncomfortable. It was, I don't know, they couldn't describe it to me exactly. They were saying things like it was too exposed or uh, too depressing, obviously, or too direct. And then I realized having lived there and, and at studying Zen Buddhism at the time with a Zen teacher, that here I was talking with Japanese people who came to the West to see, you know, the history of Christian art. And what they saw basically is the history of human suffering or, or a dominant image being a, a, a human being suffering, unbearable pain and suffering. And here they were in a culture, Buddhist, which is a religion based on suffering. The first thing the Buddha said was, all life is suffering. That's one of the fundamental principles of Buddhism. And the central image of Buddhism is not some guy suffering. It's someone sitting under a tree in meditation or on a lotus. One of the most peaceful images in the history of art, I think, is the image of Buddha. Just look at Buddha and he's absolutely calm. And of course, then you realize, you know, that's not a paradox, actually, because what Buddhism really is, is the way out of suffering, the release from suffering. That's the goal. But here you have one religion which so, so, so much emphasizes and talks about suffering in its, in its doctrine, and you have another religion, Christianity, who doesn't really, in the official doctrine, talk about suffering. It talks about forgiveness. And so I thought that was interesting. That, that paradox. And I must say, having, having kids now and going to art museums with my kids, that's the first question I get with my two little boys. It's like, Dad, what's wrong with that man? <laughs> what happened to that man? Um, it's really hard for them, actually, to watch. Um, let me show you another piece uh, from the same exhibition that I have in London. Um, and this one I've wanted to show I'm Salvatore here for a long time. Um, it's um, a series of five images that are on smaller uh, flat screens, 
What I'm going to show you again is a composite of images together in the same frame, but I'd like you to think about what the final form of the piece is, which is five images placed side by side in the way that, that, that you would see in these predella panels in the historical paintings. They're just five images placed in a row. And uh, this is my version of a digital predella panel done with the same screens that you use in your laptop computers. So c could we not show the second one on this tape? And could we show the Catherine, Catherine's room? OK. This one is about 20 minutes long. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to show you all of it, but I'm going to talk a little bit about it while we're watching it. OK? Yeah. Can I have the lights, please? This is called Blue on Blue. Here it is. That was it. You had it. Somehow I don't think Luca Signorelli had this problem exactly. These images each are about uh, 22 inches across. That's about uh, 50 centimeters or so. So here's number one, two, three, four, and five laid out in a row. This piece is called Catherine's Room. And um, even though we're not seeing the kind of detail here, um, that's in the picture. Can you push play, please, because it stopped. It's not playing. Either that or the fr did the frame grab, grab the image on the uh, converter? Because this image is not moving. We've gone back to the 15th century. What's that? OK, uh, why don't you push fast forward? That's really strange. OK, could you rewind that, please? It probably was at the end. Is it, is it going back? OK, let's try it now. Is it playing? OK, there we go. Now go forward. OK, now you can play it. OK. OK, so what we're seeing here are five scenes shot in a room. It's actually a constructed room that we made in my studio. I actually drew a picture of that room. And we measured it right from the paper. We scaled it and constructed the room. Um, it stopped again, but just, just leave it, and I'll talk about it. We have to go back.
Okay, you can play it. I think there's a problem with the tape, maybe. Okay, anyway, so what's going on here is in the first room, you can't see very clearly, but this little window that's up in the corner, there's a tree branch outside the window. And in the first panel, there are blossoms on the tree. In the second panel, there are leaves on the tree. In the third panel, the leaves are mostly gone, and it's uh, sunset. Fourth panel, you have bare branches in the evening. And the fifth panel, you have black. So that's morning, afternoon, evening. I'm sorry, morning, afternoon, sunset, evening, and night. And what goes on in this panel, since we're having some problems here to get it to play correctly, um, is this woman wakes up. I mean, she doesn't wake up, but it's in the early morning, and she does her exercises. She first w cleanses herself. She washes, washes her face from a bowl of water. And then she um, takes out a mat and does her yoga exercises uh, for the beginning of the day. The whole feeling is sort of kind of new energy of the day. And it, it's very blue sky outside with these blossoms on the tree. The second panel afternoon, she's in the corner sitting on a chair and she's mending clothes. She's sewing. And it's a very meditative, quiet panel compared to the activity of the first one. And she's just sitting there for the most part for the entire 20 minutes, just sewing clothes. And at one point, she gets up and has to walk across the room to that little table and come back. The table has a flower on it, a white lily. And um, the other thing that happens while she's sewing is a light beam appears. S a shaft of sunlight actually appears very, very gradually and, and comes through the window and illuminates the floor. It casts a very strong uh, glowing uh, uh, square of light on the floor that she actually crosses when she walks across the room to get uh, something for her sewing that she needed. Third panel, she's sitting at her desk writing. And you can see in each one of these, the furniture has changed. It's not the same room. Uh, I mean, it's not the same furniture, but it's the same room. And she's working on something, and she can't get it. She's trying to write, and she cannot get her inspiration. So it's like writer's block. She cannot think of what to do. It's very frustrating. She's trying to work. She's, she gets up. She walks around. She pours some tea. She's, she, she turns away. She cannot get it out. She can't get her idea out. And so finally, she gets so frustrated that in the only act of violence, she throws her papers down on the floor and storms around the room, really upset. And she calms down, walks back over, picks up the papers, goes back to the desk, and then the inspiration comes and she spends the rest of the time writing. While that's going on in the window, the light is getting redder and redder and redder and redder. So the whole first part of that panel, her passion, which can't come out physically, is actually coming out through the window. All the passion is in the window. Could you go back and just pause it, please? You can just scan it back. Yeah, and just pause it right there. OK. The fifth panel, she, the fourth panel, thank you, she, uh, there's a candle, one single candle lit right here. And over the course of 20 minutes, she takes a taper, a wooden stick, she takes the light from the one light, and she proceeds to light the 160 candles that are in the image, going across the floor and then all the way down, all the candles on the table. Now, at this point, you realize that what's going on here are multiple states of time, like we were talking about in pictures earlier and in video also. You have simultaneous time. You have a woman moving and doing things in these five rooms, five images. You have a time of the day. You have morning, light, afternoon, sunset, evening light and nighttime. You have time of the seasons. You have flowers, blossoms on the tree. You have leaves, summer, 
you have autumn leaves falling, you have winter, no leaves, and then you have nothing. And you also have the time of a life as represented by her activities. So in the fourth panel, this is a time later in life where from the experiences that she has or we have, you can then for the first time bring your own light into the world, which always has to come from the light of another. It's not yours. You only pass it on. So therefore, she takes the light from the candle. But she proceeds then to bring light into this dark space over time until the whole image is just glowing. And in the last one, the nighttime scene. Now the outside world at the end of life, it's not needed anymore. It's not necessary to have a connection. And this panel is about taking away the light, turning off the light. So one by one, she turns off the light, each light in the room. First this one, then she gets ready for bed. She makes the bed over here with these bed bedding uh, things, and then she takes off her clothes, and she gets into bed. And for the last half of this panel, she's just lying face up on the bed in darkness. And those are the five panels. It's about a 20-minute cycle. Can we just try just one thing? I'm very, um, I'm kind of concerned why this isn't working. Can you fast forward this? Did it go to the end of the tape? That's the end of the tape. Can you rewind it? I'm just wondering if that wasn't the end. Because the tape, uh, it should be about a 20 or 30 minute tape, and it can't be that short. That's, that's, you rewound it already? That's so short. No, okay, forget it. That's all right. We'll figure it out later. Okay, sorry that we couldn't see that working. You'd have to see it moving, but it's like, it's almost like a dollhouse because the actual panels are about this big on the wall. So, there's no sound, no sound. To, um, I'm going to show you one more video, new work. This one does have sound. And um, it's called Ascension. And uh, I don't have anything really to say about it. I'd like you to just see it. It's about, uh, we'll see about seven minutes of it, six minutes of it. And then I think maybe we'll start discussion, okay? Uh, okay. So let's turn on the last piece. And uh, don't forget to turn on the sound, okay?
that I feel when I look at your uh, works. Whenever I encountered your works in, in, in London or in England or even today, I realized that there is always room for us to look. There is a special emotional place that you create for us to be part of the video. And I was, do, I was really wondering how you do that. And particularly in the two pieces that you've shown us today, I was trying to understand why I felt this comfortable room. I didn't see you as a selfish uh, artist that imposes something on us. Uh -huh. Indeed, in the first piece that you showed us, I realized there is a third actor in it, which is the relation, the angles between the, ar the arms, hmm. these perfect angles that move, creating a new actor that we can interpret, so to say, mm -hmm. and, and, and be part of what happens there. And uh, I was wondering how you do that, because really it, it seems that there is no editing. The images flow perfectly. Right. That you might have shot them in sequence, I don't know, but in any case, they show perfectly without The last one, this, this third actor is this arrays of light that mm. do survive this man. Right. And we survive because you created this room for survival. And I was wondering whether this is a common part of your work in general or is just my feeling uh, with respect to your, your, your pieces. Thank you. Thank you. That was very, um, that's very good. Um, um, I'm basically a very positive person. And um, thinking again of my kids seeing, seeing the images of Christ on the cross, um, for many people around the world, that that's an, an extremely positive, life-giving, um, inspirational image. And I think images really reside in ourselves. That's where they really live. There are, at the same time, separate from us, but also they reflect us and we become part of them. Um, and so it has a lot to do with the person. Uh, the image is just the opening that allows you to come in. And I think what you were saying is um, that some images allow room for you more than others. For me, when Brunelleschi stepped in front of the baptistry in Florence and pulled out this strange kind of contraption with a picture on one side. You know about that, what Brunelleschi actually did when he demonstrated perspective. He built this kind of uh, tripod and he put uh, a panel of wood on it. And the panel of wood had a hole in it. And he gave who, the people who came a mirror to hold in one hand. And they came up to this piece of wood and they looked through the hole and what the whole did was to narrow down all of the scene because all of art, especially painting, is the art of eliminating things, not opening things to us. If you read Henri Bergson, the French philosopher, turn of the century, he talks about how the senses are not windows, they are limiters. Because if they were truly open to everything that's in the universe, the entire range of energy of the entire universe, the self, the individual, would be overwhelmed, consumed, and burnt. So the senses only show us a narrow part of everything that exists, as does our life. So what Brunelleschi did was he narrowed down the people's perception of their experience, even with these limited sen sensory organs we have, and limited it further by making a hole that you could only see the baptistry with. And what he had actually done then on the back of that panel, he painted the baptistry according to the new system, the new laws of optical perspective from that exact position where you were standing. So when you took the mirror and put it up like this around the other side of this panel, what you saw was a reflection of the image on the back of the panel, which was the baptistry which was painted from the point that you are standing at. So when you took the mirror and put it in front of the baptistry, of the direct view out the hole, what you saw was a painted baptistry, perfectly aligned, identical to the one you saw with your eye. So 
So you went like this, painted, real, painted, real. And you must have been completely amazed and astounded. And so what he really did, to my mind, is not show us how to paint how the eye sees. What Brunelleschi created was us. He created our position. He literally created the viewer. So no longer was the image eternal, timeless, infinite. Now the image was specific to a specific moment, a specific time, and a specific place. So he actually put us, in a way, in the picture, or put us in the position of having the picture be a reflection of where we were. And so that idea of, of giving space for people in artworks is, um, is an ancient one, too, because I'd have to say even the Byzantine older images of the Madonna, which doesn't look photorealistic to the eye, I think in some ways gives you more space because this Madonna you're seeing before the Renaissance doesn't look like any person because it probably wasn't painted from a person. It's some kind of eternal, universal type image of a woman. And she could be crying she could be just looking at us, but she allows us a lot more creativity to come to her, to project into her ourselves. Now, when you go into the consequences of Brunelleschi's uh, and Alberti's articulation of this system, and you go into these fresco cycles and into narrative painting, and you have the story coming into the painting, and you have the painter showing us a story, like a big theater set, made of scenes, then you have a situation where um, the moment is extended in time, but a story is now dominating the pictures. And now we can go, and you can go into uh, the San Francesco in Arezzo, and you can see the, the um, Piero della Francesca, and you can know the whole story of the true cross, and you get the whole story. So now we've taken a step a little bit outside the pictures because the story is so strong and it becomes a matter of identifying oh yeah there's the queen of sheba and she's going across the bridge and you know the story and that's what movies do too so what i've been interested in doing is stepping outside the dramatic narrative timeline so that this man underwater is your story not mine and the two people together who are having this incredibly difficult, uh, harrowing experience are now what you want to make them be. Because you don't know the reason why they're doing, they're undergoing that pressure. And you don't know what's going on with this man either. Is he drowning or is he going to another world? We don't know. So once I'm finding in, in the world dominated by you know, 500 years of this tradition of optical images combined with story, that when you take away the story, the, do the script, I should say, the story's still there, the script, you take away the script, then you're not concerned with the plot. And you're not concerned what someone else wrote or what someone else is telling you. Now, all of a sudden, you're back in the place, if you're an actor, where you go when the director says, okay, in this scene, you just found out your husband dies and you have to cry. And all the actresses I work with told me, well, what I do then is I go and I remember when my dog got killed when I was 12 years old, and then I can start, woo, start crying. So I guess what I'm interested in in terms of acting and, and the whole convention of those forms is the place where she goes where her dog got killed that emotion is, and not the place in the story when her husband got killed in the script. To just go right, right to that center. And maybe, like what you said, I don't know, I guess that does give a space of some sort. Um, but it is a triangle between the image, the artist, and then this other place, which is, which is us. And actually, all, all art forms really do, do that for us, too. I mean, I, to be fair, movies also give us some room, but um, not in the same way as, as uh, pictures without words. Yeah. Posso fare la domanda in italiano? Sì. 
ehm, le, lei ha detto che mh, nel Rinascimento le chiese erano ehm, dei luoghi molto reali per esporre le opere d'arte, per gli affreschi, e quindi c'era una reale interazione fra l'opera d'arte e lo spettatore. Per quali contesti lei concepisce le sue opere d'arte adesso, se non per dei musei o delle gallerie? A che contesti pensa? Um, I, um, I make... I don't think I would be truly um, satisfied or content if um, you couldn't buy my videos in the video stores in America, which you can, or you couldn't see them on television, which from time to time you can. So really, I think, I mean, thinking again in historical terms, as I mentioned earlier, when I was 26 years old and I had uh, a videotape that I made broadcast on television in New York City, seen by hundreds of thousands of people who don't necessarily go to art museums. For me, that was an incredible political, social political situation, that for the first time, artists were able to get outside the museum. Uh, and that's what this medium allows us to do. Right now, think about the opportunities for you right now. You can go take something with your camcorder, digital camcorder. You can go home or to your studio. And by midnight tonight or sooner, you can have that thing you made on the internet available to people, I mean theoretically available to people all around the world, including China and Africa and all these places. Okay, there's a situation people have to have access to computer and If they don't know you exist, how are they going to find you with millions of websites out there? Okay, we know that. But theoretically, that's the situation. Uh, it gets compounded by a lot of other factors. But I, s I think that's absolutely amazing. I don't know of any other situation that's existed like that on, in the world. Um, and then you, you add to that the ability to you know, make you know, CD-ROMs or DVD-ROMs and ha have this stuff go out. Um, it is truly a situation where, where the information wants to go out and artists again, since really almost since the Renaissance, again are given the opportunity, albeit limited and particular, but nonetheless they have the opportunity to speak in the dominant language of the culture in the dominant form of communication in the culture. Because those paintings on the walls of the churches were the mass media of the time. You know, and Pope Gregory, when he did the famous letter about images in the seventh century, when he said that these pictures are actually books for people who can't read, you know, and he realized that there's a big discussion about images in the history of the church, obviously. It's a very dangerous thing for a human being to make an image. Because if we live in the image of God, all of a sudden there are these people who are human beings who are making images. What's that about? You know, are you competing with God? Yeah. So the history of images has been very complex and very political. People have died, been killed over images. You know, these things are very powerful. The Byzantines know that when they stop the making of, of images, the iconoclasts. You know, and the Christian church, the Catholic church, had constant debates and discussions about images. Should we let these guys just make these images going, going out into the world? Um, and so at di various times they realized that these images could be useful. One of the obvious ways was that you know, for people who can't read, they can get the stories visually. And that's what a lot of those things sort of come from, that kind of tradition of uh, historia and image making. But we have a unique opportunity today in that artists again can uh, make images that can reach people in more or less a public kind of space and get outside that hospital museum I talked about. Yeah. You just talked about the Renaissance and the way uh, they tried to involve the audience with their mm -hmm. like, paintings and right. the way they, the characters used to look outside mm -hmm. and 
mm -hmm. um, the way that people used to like dress, mm, like the right. contemporary people, and and the th same kind of thing is a th thing that you use in your images as people, just actors, just mm -hmm. wear like do it. I mean, like mm -hmm. us. Right. But in your images, mm, you never show the actor that you know looks outside, mm -hmm. and um, they like. They look like if they were totally, um, like, in a different situation. You know, we look at them, and it's si there's silence, and that's quite important. And if there is sound, it is like a cathedral kind of sound. Huh. So it's really, it looks really unfamiliar, un <laughs> uncomfortable, really. Mm. And like if we looked at other people from the outside, Mm -hmm. and see them suffering and mm -hmm. mm, like mm, having really like deep moods and things like that and mm -hmm. this is like I is it like mm, if you wanted to like make the audience uh, see the mm, like other people from the outside and see what they could really feel and how, I mean, why do you do that? Is mm. it, do you want really to involve people and to uh -huh. make them think that that thing is real? Or do you want people to feel like uncomfortable in front of this kind of images? Well, um, okay. First of all, I don't think of images as being completely real. Um, they are representations. Uh, as I just explained a moment ago, in terms of world history, Sometimes they are more real than real, and they're so real that they cause wars and unspeakable violence. Um, but they have a special status. They're not completely here with us as a objective kind of thing, but they're not completely in this uh, another world, in the other world. Um, that's why they've been so dangerous to established religions. Um, it's funny you mention about the people looking out and involving us. I did a piece in the same series of work where people actually staring directly at you. It's called Witness. There are three women on small screens about this big, so just about life size. And they're looking directly at the camera, therefore at us. And they're going through these four emotional states of, of joy, sorrow, anger, and fear. And it's very, very intense to look at them. It's almost more disturbing, actually, to look at that piece than some of the things I showed you. Because there's a confrontation right away through the eyes. It's like those images of Christ as Salvatore Mundi that the artist painted, where the eyes follow you around the room. You know those stories, those pictures? Um, there's something about the direct gaze. So, um, mm, I forgot where I was going to go with that, but the... Uh, you brought up a very interesting point about feeling disconnected from the people who are in the images. And one of the difficulties I had in that piece for actors who I worked with was they're trained not to look at the camera. If you're in even a small room and you put a camera in it, they'll look around and they, their eyes will never go into the lens. They've been trained so much not to do that. You're not supposed to do that in the movies, have someone look out of the frame right at you. Now, when you bring in the whole situation of video and television and this ability of this medium to document things, I mean, you have to realize right now, the system that we have for gauging truth in our culture, European, American, is the camera. If the camera sees it, it must be real. So if, Arno, if I see a movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger, then he must be a real guy somewhere, right? If I see a young girl who's been burned in Vietnam, she must be a real girl. Now, we're leaving this situation as we speak right now. And I, I don't want to get into that right now, but that's creating a really interesting tension on the horizon that I think is going to have a major impact on art and art making is the idea that in a very short time, you're not going to be able to tell if 
that person who's on the screen is real or not because of computers and digital graphics. That, that's really amazing. And that, that's just beginning. We're losing the connection with 500 years of optical truth at the turn of the century. That's a major, major change. But nonetheless, we have this situation now. And one of the things that really has made me uncomfortable, as it does all of us, is getting back to the images of Christ and the Christian art, is the images of suffering in the public eye. And I remember being little and watching the images of the black people in the south of the US getting beat by police, watching all those images from Vietnam. And one of the most horrific things about them is that you feel completely helpless with this knowledge now that these are not actors, they're real people who are existing on earth somewhere, suffering, and I can't do anything about it. And when I had the personal experience of losing my mother in 1991, I would have to say up until that point in my life and being with her when she died, at, at her bedside. I never really had a connection between love and suffering. No, I, I did some videos after that, but I'm talking about my experience, not my art. And up until that time, for me, suffering was something I saw on television or something that I read about in the newspaper to all these people. And it could never really think too deeply about that because it would be too disturbing. You could never get there. And then when she was suffering and she was dying and you're there and you still feel helpless, but you see it in the context of a necessary process of life. She wasn't in an accident or anything. She was older. And you see it as a connection to your family and to the people you love. And even though you can't do anything because of medical technology and so on, you can still be there. And that was a completely life-changing experience about, about the separation and distance we have with images. And it made me believe really that the, the problem is, getting back to these images of Christ's suffering in the art that the kids and, and people outside the religion have a problem with, it's not the, the, the problem's not the suffering, it's the lack of love in general in connection with suffering that we feel in all of these images, profane images that surround us in mass media. Right. Well, um, I'm very impressed for the images I see. Um, Bado? Okay. <laughs> um, I'd like to say some, just some things. Um, um, something important for me. Maybe it's only my way to see that in medicine. Maybe it's completely wrong, but I, I try. Mm. Uh, first of all, uh, for the first video, cra um, breakdown, I think, uh, remember. Um, I would like to ask you, uh, what is your relationship with Michelangelo? Because for me, uh, you, talk about that video, you introduce it, and you talk about um, Professor Settis. Mm -hmm. And me, in my mind, mm -hmm. I, talk abo I th thought about uh, the um, Pietà di Michelangelo. Huh. And um, in, in my mind, that video would, would finish in another way, mm -hmm. because um, I expected it, because I s start to see it uh, mm, a woman, a man, mm. uh, a woman suffering, mm. maybe suffering for that man, maybe yeah, suffering yeah. as uh, the Madon mm, la Madonna uh -huh. for uh, his son Christ. Mm -hmm. And in Pietà of Michelangelo, uh, it's a very strange iconography because the La Madonna, okay. Yeah. Uh, the Virgin uh -huh. is young, and right. mm, Christ is not a baby, it's right. not a child. Is mm, that is crucified? Is that is mm, an adult? And I want to see that. I expected that. Hmm. 
maybe because I I believe in that for my education, my religion, my faith. I, yeah. I think I can say. Uh -huh. And when it ended, I think, why? Why? N why now? <laughs> mm. There's something. It's not completed for me. Mm. And in uh, well, the the only answer is you are mm, so clever. So really mm, amazing for me. But uh, when I have this kind of art in front of me, uh -huh. if I want to be a, a art historian, a critic of art, uh -huh. I can say nothing. Because you, are w you said everything. <laughs> <laughs> I have to, mm, to talk about myself. Uh -huh. And the only thing I can do is, I think, make art by myself, huh. uh, me. <laughs> you, mm, you, uh, mi costringe, non so, no, mi si. no, force me to to be so free to see what I want to see in that mm -hmm. that I can't see nothing <laughs> at mm -hmm. that time, and I think it's mm, really wonderful from a side and mm -hmm. <laughs> panic. Well, let me let me <laughs> let me just other. respond. To you bring up a very important <laughs> point, and that is that. It I mean, as Professor Seda said at the beginning, you know, I'm feeling, and I'm not alone in this, feeling a deep connection with the past, and I think very much that's what our age is now. In the same way, in the Renaissance, they actually at that time were simultaneously avant-garde. I mean, look at the ages of these guys. You know, Masaccio was like 26 when he did Trinity. Tr La Trinità, Michelangelo was like 28 when he did David. Raphael was 27 when he did Stanza della Segnatura. These were not old guys. They weren't old masters. These were the young guys with the new ideas, with the laptop computers, with the you know 3D graphics and the internet and the whole thing. You know, it was absolutely, completely new. At the same time, what were they doing? They were connecting with the past. They were connecting with the ancient Roman culture and all the classical Greek and Roman stuff that they were had seen but nobody had actually looked at before. So the beautiful thing about history is not only that it repeats itself and we can find certain key points and nexus in history where there is a connection to the past which I believe is today what very much is going on today. But at the same time history is also linear and it, ex it exists for us today in a way it hasn't existed to any of these other cultures. And the further we go into the future, because of research and, and, and science and the expansion of knowledge, actually the more we know about the past. So the progression of human beings is not a line, a leading edge of a wave going through uh, history, through time. It's actually a circle point, like throwing a stone in the pond that radiates out, going backwards in time with more and more clarity and going forwards and horizontally in time and vertically in time and more with more clarity. Uh, and that's really important. So, so we have the knowledge of Michelangelo. You have that in you when you see images now. If you've studied these things or have been exposed to them, even if you haven't, you have hardwired into your operating system right now the idea of heaven, middle earth, and hell, which is what you see when you see a triptych in Western art. It's not uh, some kind of motif or some kind of compositional form or some historical form. It's the shape of your consciousness about how the world is created. You have that pre-programmed in your brain, in your body, in your being, that this idea of multi-leveled universe. You know, someone had to think of it first. Aristotle gave us multi-leveled universe. But you don't even think about it anymore. So there's lots of things like that that you connect with. And uh, as far as not having anything to say, I think the greatest thing about any work of art is, um, well, if I could just say from my own personal experience, and if, if any of you here are artists, you'll know what I mean. When you see a really good work done by a contemporary artist, and I'm not speaking right at the moment to the art historians, but if you want to understand what I'm saying, think of in your own field, whatever your field is. 
because at the same time we are colleagues, we're also competitors. We have those two things in ourselves. That's human nature. That's why we move forward. And so for the artists, you see a really good work of art by our colleague, especially as you get older and out of university and you realize that art now is no longer just something you study, but it's actually your livelihood, which is a strange phenomenon. Like you have to make money to live and you have artistic talent, so maybe you can do that. That's a very strange and difficult position. So you see a work by another artist, and for me anyway, there's two reactions, two main reactions. One is, ah, why didn't I do that? <laughs> I should have done that first. You know, I'm sure Michelangelo and Raphael were like that all the time. And you know the stories. Why did Gary Hill make that video piece? You know, I should have made that. Okay, that's the competitive side. Then, I think the more pure side under that, which is the place of the gift and not of property, and that is, wow, that's a really good piece. And the feeling you have is you want to immediately drop everything and go right to your studio and work. And that's the most positive thing. That's the life-giving force of creativity. That's where competition and all that stuff just disappears. That's where you get the inspiration that even if it's an artwork you don't like or even if it's a style you don't do or even if it isn't someone you're really competing with in your own field, you just feel the creativity in it and it gives you creativity and you just go. The first response is the deepest response is to create again. And that will never, never leave no matter if it's video, computers, or anything. So I don't believe that there's nothing to say. <coughs> I have a question, if it's possible. Yes. Yes, I'm here. You're where? <laughs> yes, here. Oh, there you are. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I told you, media is everywhere. It disperses <laughs> the spirit around the room. Go ahead. So I would like to know something about uh, your way of working. In particular, I would like to know which kind of instruction, if there are, uh, you give, you give, mm -hmm. for instance, in doing the videos that we, uh -huh. we saw. And second, um, how many times uh, did you record, for instance, the first video that we saw today? Okay, Thank that's you. a very good question. Um, the instruction I gave um, varies based on the piece, of course, but I'd say, generally speaking, working with actors, as I explained, I couldn't, well, let me just say, when I did the greeting, which is being shown in, in Carmignano right now, um, the actresses were uncomfortable being completely free. So when we first started, at the very beginning, we gave them names and kind of a position. The woman in blue in the center, sh we, we said that she's, kind of shy and insecure and when this other person arrives she kind of just goes back and moves back away. Um, and, and then once we started working um, we were able to just, they were able to just sort of take that and just be free with it and not have to worry about that. But at the initial meetings, the initial rehearsals we had, the actresses were concerned about, this, again, the script. They wanted the script. So that's a very common thing. So I've come to work with a number of people over the years that don't need the script. And not coincidentally, these are primarily former dancers, performance artists, and if they were involved in theater, it's more experimental kind of theater. And some of them actually were in, um, uh, there's a woman uh, I've worked with, Mary Pat Gleason, who was in this piece I did uh, um, in, uh, that I showed in New York last October. Uh, and she's in this movie Traffic by Steven Soderbergh. So there's some of them are, you know, acting commercially and stuff. But um, all of them have the ability to connect very abstractly. Like the two you saw at the beginning, I told them that there is a force, a pressure that's closing in on you and it's going to crush you. And it's physical. And I didn't even have to tell them that it was emotional and spiritual because they 
absolutely knew that, and they had worked with me on other things, so they knew I was interested in the emotional powers. But I told them I, I wanted to make it physical so it wasn't intellectual for them about acting. I wanted to make it really physical, and I told them that this thing is closing in on you, and it's squeezing, and all your being, you need to gather all of the strength you have inside yourself to overcome it. And I talked them through that when we were doing that. And that's the first take. There, in something like that, you can't do more than one or two. I did two takes because, you know, sometimes the film gets jammed in the camera and stuff. So I, the second take is not interesting at all. Second take is very self-conscious. And once they go through what you saw on the screen, there's no way you're going to, you know, get them to go that deep again. So it's, I knew I had one chance, really, to do it. This is a curiosity I have because I study at the film school and uh -huh. actually I study editing. We are a few of us. So all of the uh, works I saw uh, made from you are one take and uh, no, with no editing, even mm -hmm. if they're images. And I was thinking about that in right now in this world, we always, uh, editing is something that it's not like at the beginning of the century that it was something shock. Right. Uh, shocking and uh, like you know you have A and B yeah. and A and B give something totally different right now we, right. we are used to to see images together and we don't even have the sense of what really is have one thing and another thing and what right. they give together right. and I don't know I, w I, I want to ask if if it's something that like it's a kind of painting uh, uh, point of view that you give uh -huh. or because what I see is actually that there is editing I make my own editing huh. because this like this very the um, Carmignat the greeting right at the, the first time I didn't see the I didn't see the the two people on the, the back right second time I was I, I made my own my the whole story like uh, I don't know I uh, it's like when um, the, the great uh, director Eisenstein used to sure. give a paint a painting, uh, and then uh, all all his all uh, his students had to uh, like uh, choose pieces and make their their own story. Huh. So what is shocking me is like it's one shot, but there is I feel there is editing inside it, in one shot. It's like this uh, distance between the camera and the fact. Right. And these, um, the, maybe because it's very slow, gives you the idea of the, the power of the image. It's right. like it's more powerful. And I find my, my own editing. I don't know. I want, mm. I want to know the, your feeling about it. Well, thank, thank you. That's a very good uh, thing to talk about. First of all, in all of these images I showed you, and uh, unfortunately we couldn't see the one with the woman in the room moving, but. Um, they all have editing in them. There are probably, in the first piece I showed with the two people, there's probably about 30, I don't call them cuts, but things going on, layers that you don't see during the course of that image. And what I was doing was repositioning the people digitally because I shot a film frame that's much bigger than what you see. So I was carefully positioning them. In some cases, I stretched them a little bit. Um, and shaded things, brought up contrast and color exactly. It took, it took a day just to work with that. And it, and it was a single take from the camera, but then later when you go into the editing room, for me, editing is very similar to painting. Uh, you know, it's not only about this, the, the archetypal cut that Eisenstein so eloquently defined for us. And, and so, so there's, there's really two precedents to what you're talking about, the idea of the continuous image. And I don't mean the still image. It's a very important difference. You can say, okay, the images on the walls of the churches here and in Florence are continuous images. That's true. But when you're dealing with a moving image, the hardest thing to present is eternity because we don't have that much tape. So, uh, <laughs> so 
the precedents of this kind of continuously evolving image without any cuts are two. One is video. I come from video, not film. Right now in this city and in Florence and throughout Italy and throughout the world, there are cameras on the walls of the banks looking at the room. In some cases, those cameras have been on the wall for 10 years or more looking at the same room without blinking, without cutting, without stopping. So it's completely natural technically for video to be the constant continuous open eye to the world with no cuts, no breaks, no frames. Now that's amazing. Parallel to human life. Okay? First time in art, in images, artificial image parallel to, to life. So the idea of cutting in video is very abstract. I mean, it's a very difficult technological uh, process. It now seems easy, but when it first started, as I said earlier, you couldn't record video, let alone cut it at the beginning. It was just the cameras were always on. Um, now, the other precedent to what you're saying is life itself. From the moment you were born, from the moment your heart started beating inside your mother's womb until now, there has not been a single cut in your life. Even when you sleep and if you knock, get knocked in the head, the only thing that turns out are these lights, but the electricity stays on. So the notion of a cut is completely abstract in terms of nature, totally abstract as is photography, as I mentioned earlier. Photography is extraordinary because it is so common and so understood universally throughout the world, and yet it shows us something that does not exist in nature. A one thousandth of a second does not exist in nature. You cannot take a one thousandth of a second or a five hundredth of a second or a one hundredth of a second out of the time flow. We cannot do that. Impossible. The only thing that can do something like that is this thing called the camera, photo camera, that actually just holds light for a brief time on a surface that fixes the, the light patterns. That's all. But it doesn't stop time or anything like that. In fact, the beauty of photography is that time keeps going. That's why it's so special. So you see the images of you when you were young, and you see the images of your parents when they were young, and it's shocking because there's these two old people in front of you right now, and they don't look like that photo anymore. And people are wearing different clothes, and the cars are all different. So the time didn't stop. The time kept going. That's why photography is, is power of photography draws on the fact that it does not stop time, that time keeps going continuously. Um, so that's why film is, for me, still to this day, very strange. And I've started, as you know, you've probably seen some of my videos. They do have cuts in them. And I've worked with more or less a montage kind of style for many years. and I've made works even relatively recently that have cuts. But more recently, I guess I'm get, getting more and more interested in this idea of continuous time, of the kind of the eternal moment, and something that evolves gradually and, and changes and turns and flows in time the way water comes down a mountain stream and goes over the rocks, you know, and just keeps going. You look at it now, it it's looks one way. You look at it a moment later, it's totally different, but there's a continuity to it. That, that interests me a lot, and it's becoming more and more possible technically um, to do that. Hi. I just wanted to ask you, now that um, yeah. thanks to artists like you, we are over in visual arts, we're over fragmented space and fragmented time represented on a two-dimensional panel. Now that we are at the, this stage, what do you think is next? What do you feel as a barrier on a technological point of view mm -hmm. or psychological point of view or? Right. Well, um, I guess for the, I'd say really for the first time in my life, I can see uh, enough I've, I've, I've experienced enough to get a sense of what's coming, to get a sense for the first time that maybe I won't be able to complete that in my lifetime. But what, what I see as, as something that's on the horizon that um, is not really acknowledged yet is 
the end of the visual language. Because right now there's so much, you know, if you're an artist, one of the great, greatest training you have received up till now in terms of being an avant-garde contemporary artist is the notion of the avant-garde. And the notion of the avant-garde is basically to go against whatever is the dominant thing that exists. So a very simple thing which has been practiced by spiritual uh, uh, devotees for millennia is you take whatever meets the eye, whatever you see, whatever you know, and you just flip it upside down or turn it backwards. Or if they say do this, you do the opposite. You know, that's a really great, almost mechanical way to be sure that you're going to do something creative and new. Um, so think of right now, what's the big thing? The visual culture, right? I mean, it's been around for a little while, but it is accelerating now with the internet and with computers. And you have generations of young people coming out now that have grown up in this idea that visual images are information and that, that the, the, the combination of visual images is a kind of a language and that that the whole culture seems to be working on visual images and computers which started out as text numeric systems originally now are being forced to to uh, process images which is why it takes up so much memory and so much computing power because that's ag almost against what computers can do well is process visual information but we're making them do that because it's so important but if you really think of what's really going on what's really going on is really known right now to probably the most serious computer programmers who are working with some of these systems, including the visual ones. And that is the world of the code that underlies the pictures and the code that underlies the system. And it's no coincidence that at the same age, at the same point in time in history, that we have these things called computers, that millions and millions of people are becoming, it's becoming part of daily life and that a smaller number, but a growing number of people are getting very familiar technically with how these things work and how to manipulate them and how to use them. At that same point in history, we have decoded the human genome. That we have turned a human being into a series of code, biologically. So the new idea of anatomy, going back to these great artists in this neighborhood, here in Italy, going back to the idea of anatomy for Leonardo and Michelangelo and those guys. We have moved from the idea of anatomy as hardware to anatomy as software. So what defines a human being? Not the mechanical, hydraulic, pneumatic functioning of a series of parts like a machine, which we know. But now what's defining what a human being is, is some abstract code. DNA that you could write down on a piece of paper. So what I see in terms of how this resonates with artists and creative work and visual culture is that I can see a point where there will be people who will become more interested in the code than in the pictures and who will be able to look at the world as a form of code and understand underlying structures to the world and make new connections to those structures that are not visual, that are not visual. They're philosophical. When you make an image with a computer, it's a philosophical system for creating an image, even more than vanishing point perspective. Because what you're doing is you're creating, the, the th in 3D graphics, if you want to model this bottle and these glasses and the water in it, and the light and the reflections and the colors and everything. I mean, Leonardo would have loved this stuff, right? If you ha want to model that in 3D graphics, what you have to do is you have to create the entire three-dimensional space, including what the point of view looking at this doesn't see. Because when you make a 3D model of, of a piece of reality in the computer, what you're doing is you're, you're modeling the, the scene in three dimensions, and the last thing you do is put in the point of view. Where is the point of view? They even call it a camera. It's a virtual camera. And they put it here. And then they can put lights here and here and here and here. But meanwhile, for the camera, the backside of this exists in the computer. You could put the point of view over here, and then you'd see this. But f in the painting, when you paint that, this side does not exist. It's not there. So now you have this system that's actually 
a, a, a way of compre comprehending the whole world, not only the visual parts, in some kind of uh, system of code, in a kind of a language, which describes the behavior of light and the point of view and how far a window is and so on and so forth. It's really interesting. And I think the young artists in the future are going to gradually realize that the visual image is not the most important thing. It's what tickles your eye right now. It's what's really exciting. But in actual fact, the underlying codes that underlie that will allow you to make connections between things that have never been connected before. Anyway. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi. I'd like to ask you something about your... The <laughs> okay. La last one. Last one. Okay. About the creative process of your works. I mean, uh, uh, do you follow a suggestion or... Uh, or um, yeah, uh, a revelation, or, or sometimes you feel the need to communicate something, uh, something like a feeling or a f the fear or something, and so on. Well, it, it really varies a lot. Sometimes I get a very precise uh, image of what I want to do, and I almost uh, receive very precise instructions down to really, really fine details, where I know exactly what I'm going to do. Um, the process to receive that image, that inspiration, of course, is a long one. But when it comes, sometimes it's complete. I haven't had that experience too much, but I have had it several times. And then the other time, which is probably more common, is, is it's like someone comes up to the curtain and they just go like this. And they close it again. <laughs> and you just get a glimpse, just a glimpse of something really interesting. And you feel from that glimpse, you sense the whole. It's like getting the eye of the elephant looking through a crack in the wall. And all of a sudden, you realize there's an elephant there. And you kind of feel it. You know it. And then the process of making becomes working your way through to, open it, to, to increase that opening so you can get to that thing. Um, that's probably more common. And then in terms of where ideas and inspirations come from, I think, uh, obvious, you, you have to spend time alone. You know, Creativity comes from boredom. If you look at kids, if you look at kids, you know, put kids in a room and give them two wooden sticks and they will make the most amazing things with those wooden sticks. But if you put them in a room with TV or something like that, they'll just... <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you know, a wooden stick is just a wooden stick on the ground. It's not a train or or something, you know? So uh, being bored and having time is the most precious commodity in our society, and that's why, that's why the monks stayed in their cells, and that's why the, the holy men in Tibet went on top of the mountain in the little hut, and that's why, you know, all the saints and mystics always got away from the whole thing and had time to be, to let the noise die down so they, they can hear the voices. And that's the biggest problem in the media age because they fill in all of our time with voices in the car, at home. Some people can't come in a room alone and not turn on the TV or the radio you know, anymore. So how are the voices going to, how's the voice on the wind you know, that Mary heard when it, Gabriel came through the window? You see those great paintings, there's always stuff's blowing, you know, the pages in the book in the, in the uh, uh, Robert Campan Annunciation, you see the pages blowing. You know. How are you going to hear the voices if they're filled up by some you know, commercial producer? Anyway, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.